in school when you would fill out what your parents did for a living, I would write trimmings not knowing what the heck it was. When they opened up the window in the sweatshop, I used to go play on the roof. Isn't that a great place where you could play? I said, God, let the morning come <laughs> quick so I can go to my sewing machine. I think I'm nuts. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Sewing Community, the podcast where local Westchester area residents share their life in fabric and thread. I am your host, Aaron Page, Director of Folk Arts at Arts Westchester, the officially designated Arts Council for Westchester County, New York. For the last several months, Arts Westchester has been teaming up with Amanda Browder, a Brooklyn-based fabric artist, to transform our nine-story building of White Plains into a cascading, colorful fabric installation. All of the stories heard in this podcast were collected from individual volunteers who've been involved in the building of this monumental work of public art. While the project is currently on hold because of COVID-19, our hope is that the stories shared here will in some small way sustain and deepen the social fabric of our sewing community. This week's episode features Westchester County's go-to sewing machine repairman Mitch Wasserberg as he discusses his family connections to the New York trimmings, fabric, and sewing machine business. Mitchell Wasserberg is my name and I grew up in uh, Yonkers, New York. Presently live in uh, Hartsdale. Lived a couple years in Carmel, New York and we came back the Hartsdale because I was working in Bayside, Queens at the time and uh, in the sewing machine business. And I'm doing this since 1970, the same year that I graduated high school. Went to college for a year in seven eighths to play baseball, didn't finish, and uh, got involved in the sewing machine trimming fabric business with my parents and my brother in 82nd Street and Broadway. And from there, we went to Riverdale in the Bronx, Bayside, Queens. Two stores on Maranek Avenue and White Plains, not far from 31 Maranek Avenue. Galleria Mall, White Plains Mall, and now a small shop in Hartsdale. Knocking on doors, repairs, learning the business from many, many people over the years. Each one has something special that I learned from and has kept me going for all these years. So I have no complaint in this business, still enjoy it, still get a kick out of it. Not as easy as it used to be due to the internet. 70% 70% of the mom and papa stores are done, finished, due to the internet. You just can't compete. But uh, in a small shop with one person, it's doable, and I've done it, and uh, so far so good. A lot of phone calls, they'll call and say, do you fix an old machine? And I'll say, how old is the machine? They'll say, 10 years old. And I tell them, 10 years old is still a, a, a teenager, a baby. A lot of retail sewing machine stores will not fix old machines. I don't know why. Maybe, maybe they can't, maybe they don't have any way of getting the parts, but my livelihood is fixing the old machines. The older the better, because they fix well and they are they were made well. The newer machines, some of them are very difficult to fix because they just don't come apart. They're, they're, they're made to be thrown away. The older uh, German Pfaff machines are beautiful to work on. They, they fix well. The older uh, black Singer sewing machines, the old heavy-duty metal sewing machines, that uh, can last forever if they're taken care of. The machine fixing end came actually from watching a couple older gentlemen my age now, early 80s, who worked at a Singer factory in Mount Vernon. And I would go over there Saturday mornings and watch them fix machines. They would allow me. They knew I had, my parents had a dealership in the Bronx. So I would drive over to Mount Vernon to watch a couple of these guys do some work. Some of them would help, some of them didn't want to give away their secrets. And just taking the machines apart and, and working on them until you got it right and then finding out what mistakes you made and, 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 and learning, learning from that. My mother's father had a trimming store on the Lower East Side and my mother was a kid, 11, 12 years old and she worked the store downstairs. My grandfather who died when I was born lived upstairs and when my grandmother needed help she'd ring a button or a bell and he would come down. So the trimming business has been in my mother's family for, from the turn of the century. My father got involved in the trimming business with my mother's brother Murray Malcolm and they worked together in New York City. My uncle Murray went his own way and my father had stores in Harlem, 850 Amsterdam Avenue and as a five-year-old kid I used to go down with my father 
and just sit and watch what he did for a living. And I never really knew what he did because he was called trimmings. And when, in school, when you would fill out what your parents did for a living, I would write trimmings not knowing what the heck it was. I later learned what it, what it was, it's a true story. Trimmings would be pearls, uh, sequins, um, rhinestones, anything that had glitter to it that would attract the eye to bring people into a store. And well, we also handled a lot of yarn in the old days. Yarn was a big deal. I guess this would probably be from 80 to 85, all kinds of yarn. And my job was to go park the car in the Lower East Side and walk all the shops and pick up all kinds of odds and ends of merchandise that we could bring uptown to 82nd Street and, and, and sell. It was a tiny store across the street from the New York Ballet. And the ballet used to come in and buy all kinds of pink ribbon for their uh, ballerina shoes. So trimming was a big deal. We also sold to some of the people in TV commercials used to come in. I can't remember the names. Uh, one guy was very famous. He did the cola nut commercial. Big tall guy. He would come in and uh, a lot of celebrities would walk in with their children to buy odds and ends. Our favorite customers in the old days was Sugar Ray Robinson's mother. Her name, she's long gone. Her name was May Robinson. And... She was an unbelievable sweetheart, one of my father's nicest and best customers, and she would talk about uh, her son, who my father grew up watching. Jerry Stiller used to pass by, we waved to him, and this is 82nd Street and Broadway. Ben Gazzara would pass by, wave. Um, Ann Mira, Mayor Koch, and Elston Howard. I don't know if anyone knows who Elston Howard was, but he was a baseball player. He, he would pass by in the Bronx store. One, one quick little story I remember from watching my father. We used to have high-end buttons, believe it or not, called rhinestone buttons. And my father would go out of his way, spend hours with the salesman picking out beautiful buttons, rhinestone buttons that would be purchased by my father and put into silver boxes with tissue paper to make them look more attractive. And my job was the buttons. I, I was called the button guy. And I would sew all the buttons on the outside of a box, put them on a wall, and wait for someone to purchase them. But one gentleman came in from New York City who was um, a com on TV commercials and two weeks in a row he would buy these buttons on Saturday and return them on Monday and to return 15, 20, 25 bucks was a big hit in those days. So the third Monday he came in and he says sorry but again these don't match. So I, I, I looked at them and there was thread left on the outer part of all these buttons and I think they were 350 each was a big deal in the old days. So I, I looked at him, and before we did anything, I said to him, um, by the way, how was the show? He goes, the show was great. Uh, and he stepped right in it. What he did is he would use these buttons on his TV commercials, sew them onto the garment, and then bring them back and get another set of a different style until we finally put two and two together. My parents got involved in the fabric business, mostly in the Bronx. 5539 Broadway in Riverdale, 231st Street. Big, big store, but it was actually rented by my father through the Singer Service people, Singer Company. So someone had to take care of sewing machines, and there was no one there. And when I went in, I got involved with it, enjoyed it, and they gave me about 30, 50 square feet of a 2,000 square foot store to do the machines because no one really believed that you could make a living doing it. Well, we did and it expanded and uh, I left the fabric business and got more involved with the machines, repairs, factory machines because there was, there was a couple dollars involved. The fabric business, which I love and to this day I still do, very difficult. And, um, and that was in the 80s and then um, when we moved up to the Galleria, it was a huge fabric store, did very, very well. But in Westchester County, the rents, again, did not allow us to make a living selling fabric. So the machines is what, is what really allows me to, to make a living, and, and, and I enjoy it. And uh, I tell people straight out what's up, what's not up, fixable, not fixable. So uh, at my age, if they believe me, that's great. If they don't, that's okay, too. Thank you for listening to Sewing Community. Next week's episode features Diana Loja, Hispanic community liaison for the village of Sleepy Hollow, as well as three members of the Loza family, a father, brother, and daughter, as they discuss their personal and family connections to sewing and tailoring in Ecuador. 